Yeah. So that's why it's just comments up. But uh, here, how this uh, library is being used? Let's say you have like a my app.exe, and then it is calling the right file that is uh, actually belongs to kernel32.dll. Then if this there is a function call, then it goes to here kernel32.dll. Then in the inside actually you know write file in the kernel to the DLL, it is doing nothing but actually calling a function that belongs to ntdll.dll. Then from there, ntdll.dll actually calls some system call that located in the kernel. All right. And process. Everyone knows what process is, right? But let's go back. Uh, what I want to point it out. I know this is a. Um, basic, but it's also it's very fundamental. So we do want to, you know, uh, uh, clarify what they. If you see, I think the explorer.exe, this one is not a process. This is a file that located in the uh, disk, right? When you actually run it, then it becomes a process. And we want to use another tool to actually see it. Okay, and I do need to start from here. Give me a second. How can I see? You see the. Uh, it should be. Slideshow. Oh, there we go. So from the corner slide, there we go. It should be FY. Thank you. All right. So, process is an instance of program called in the execution. And okay, I just pointed out the file that you see in the explore.exe is not the process, it's just a file. And when a process starts, which means it actually read into the memory, then that uh, process we're gonna have uh, the heap, heap uh, space and stacks and what else? And it has a uh, uh, library files also in the map into the memory in the same process uh, memory space. Tokens. Tokens. Sure, handles. So it's a some. All right. So I mentioned that one and uh, APIs to access other process memory. Okay. Why process I was mentioning it is. Keep in mind that when once the program runs, it has its own memory space. That means by default, one process cannot access to the other process memory. Okay, but this is in general. But there is a APIs you can do it. And to those uh, example like a read process memory, write process memory, and virtual a lot ex. And during the some of the uh, following lab, we will actually see it, you know, how uh, one process injecting some code into another process, okay? And, okay. So process context switch is like, you know, on the CPU usually is fast, is multitasking, but in reality, you know, if it's, you have multi-core, it is a multi-processing, multi but if it's, you have only one process with one core, then in reality, it is not actually multi-processing. Uh, at a certain given time, only you know one process is actually running. And but when we just see it, since it is actually moving in between a process to another process so fast, we just not seeing you know not seeing those you know uh, process context switch. But okay, now I kind of explain it different a difficult way. But okay, if you have a one process with a one core. At a given time, only one process is running, and when you uh, you hand over to another process, there's like a, con a process context switch, and all the information related to the you know existing process actually being stored into like a process control block PCB, and then the other process take its turn and then runs, and if we just swipe in a time to swipe, then this PCB is being used where this you know, existing process is left from. So you can do the uh, process uh, context switch. Okay, any question? Is there anything that is not clear? Okay, all right. And this one, it shows, uh, let's say you have one executable file, there is like a wicked suite app, when this one start running, then loader actually see p header and then see what DLL this uh, wicked suite app uh, depends on, right? Then the loader actually use the header and then read in this you know uh, my 
want the DLL and my lib to the DLL or lib C. Anything this one depending on and it's it read into this Wikisuite app uh, that you have to process this memory space. Okay. You can think memory space it is really everything from zero to FFFF. That's its own memory space. It actually has the memory space. Okay, but by default, half of them is actually still belongs to kernel. The user space process actually cannot access to it directly. But uh, as a uh, user, um, process memory space why it actually have everything. Any question about this graph? It is basically uh, summarizing uh, so far what we learned libraries and then process. All right, here, again, this one is emphasizing that when you have multiple processes, it has its own memory space, okay? And anyone heard ASLR, okay, address, space, L -L layer randomization? <laughs> yeah, I got it all right, <laughs> layer randomization. Okay, so what it means is, you know, when when there was a no memory randomization, then the the address that certain you know, module here module means ESE or the DLL is mapping to the memory can be uh, predicted. Okay, then actually uh, that's one of the uh, facts that you know malicious code can you know exploit it. So but so so ASLR is introduced, but here, actually, what, what I want to uh, emphasize is once every reboot and when process is running, certain, like, most libraries actually are mapping to the same address. So, for example, if kernel 32 DLL is mapping to like a memory 40000, then for in the different uh, process, the kernel 32 DLL is actually mapping to, into the same uh, address. So here, ASLR, is, that's, a, that's a even Windows 7 to the same thing. When you reboot, memory randomization is per reboot rather than between the processes. Does it make sense or is it not clear? Okay, now, I guess this one is slightly, uh, that's actually one extra information, more important power as uh, if there's an application in the memory space, it has its own heap and stack. Okay? Who, who, okay, what's the heap, heap memory address? So when you need a memory on the, on the runtime, then uh, a process and program can call, like, um, if it's a C in the list, it's malloc, it's a M A L L C L L O C, right? If it's memory mem model or for Windows case, probably create memory, something like that. You know, there is a certain function called that it has a big uh, heap memory chunk and you call some specific a API, then it gives you like a small chunk of code to the uh, application. So that's from the heap memory, with what a memory that you allocate during the runtime. How about stack? How the stack memory is being used? When you say stack, stack memory is rather allocated, it is uh, allocating usually the word is that in general used for the heap, but stack usually call it not allocated, it's like a mapped, no, not yeah. even mapped is not correct. Stack memory, what is usually, I'm going to just summarize what uh, they said. And so stack memory is mainly used for the function function for the functions which means usually for the local variables okay who, who okay I'll, I'll just explain it as a, so in the program there's a two types of uh, uh, variables right one is global and one is local global usually you define outside of the functions and global variables usually you can't access from any uh, functions in the program right local variable on the other hand it is uh, defined inside the uh, function, right? And only the function can access to that uh, variable. Okay, now here, 
the important thing is then where that okay, I'm going to go this one where that is being uh, where are being located in this uh, uh, picture. If it is global variable, let's say we keep uh, sweet app that has some global variable A. Where are we gonna be at? Hmm? Not in the stack. Not in the stack. Yes, that is a correct. <laughs> How about who can get the more specific? Where the global variable A belongs to in this, you know, picture. Global variable, when you have program and when you compile it, the P file has a global variable in it, basically. If it is, uh, I mentioned about the sections, right? You can have that data section. I think that data section inside the P file, it has a initialized global variable that is included inside the P file. And if it's not initialized uh, global variable, then wait a minute, that, uh, is a that, I don't know, no, is that data. Okay, if it's not initialized global variable, then it is uh, in the, in that BSS section. So for a global variable, you know, when you have a global variable, just uh, declare it. But generally, when you start, what is being initialized, which is zero, right? For global variable, you just initialize as zero. If you if you do, do not ex, uh, explicitly in, in, uh, initialize it, then those variable is located in the like that BSS section inside the P file. If you initialize it like into A to three, then it is initialized. Uh, um, then it is uh, located in the that data section. If if the P file has it, it can be slightly different, but and so I explained that those global variables are belongs to P file, right? Then where do you think once you have global uh, variables, where do you think it is belongs in this map? This is part of the P file. Yes. Since it is P file, is the global variable information is actually in the P file. When that you know the application is mapped into the memory, then it is somewhere here, right? That's where global variable is located in the memory. Okay. And if it's a local variable, where is that then? Local. Stack. Yes, right. That's right. This is stack, right? If there is a function call, usually in stack, is that move from the uh, high address to the low address. So if there's a function call, then the stack includes where the uh, local variables. And not only that, since you have a function call, it has information about like a return address. For example, I have my function a dot uh, function a, and function a calls prenf, right? So what it happens is when the function a calls prenf, the stack grows like a downward. So in the stack memory, uh, some local variables belongs to prenf. It is like a puppy, uh, push it to the stack. And once the printout finishes this functionality, you need to return, right? Those return uh, values in the stack. So it can go back and forth from, uh, from the, uh, this function calls. Okay? Is it, do you think, is it this amount is okay, or do you want me to uh, explain a little detail? Yeah, I'm explaining those, that one, okay? So just making sure this one, in general, cannot read the uh, memory from all the different process. That's the one important part. Any question? They usually have you know, the code belongs to that text. Global variable, initialized global variable belongs to that data. And uninitialized, which is going to be like your zero, is, uh, belongs to that BSS uh, section. But there's a, oh, what I'm going to explain is that's a convention, but that means compiler doesn't have to follow it. Okay, it can, yeah, you can just generate some other you know, random name. So that is, which is actually okay with a P, P5, P5 or P5 parser or the loader. They can understand, even if they don't follow the convention. Okay? Yes, shift F5. All right. 
Any question here so far? Uh, one thing, important thing that I did. P, P, uh, PID is a when process runs, it has its own unique identifier. So P, PID, and we want to use a tool to check the PID. All right, there you go, right time. So let's go to your VM. Let's close it, close it. So when you close everything, do you see the uh, just desktop? So I don't want you to have like 10 windows open. Then later on, you know, you don't know which one is you are looking at later. Okay. When you see this one, and I am explaining slide 21. Okay. Let's see. So we learned uh, processes. And which we already know, but now let's see they are uh, using some tools. So process is not something that you can see in the explorer, right? It, you need to use some other tools. Another example is a Windows Task Manager. So how I launched this one was start. There's a one, and I type Task Manager as a task. MGR task manager and there's a tabs and I selected processes right so there's an application tabs tab and there's a processes tab so application is more you know one one application may have only multiple processes right so it's more grouped but when you see that processes it is a what list every single processes that's running on this system. Okay, and from here, by default, you don't see the PID, right? From here, go. Is it option options? Wait a minute. Oh no. View, select columns. Do you see PID here? Select and OK. Now you see PID of processes that is running on your system, right? I selected view, select columns, and PID. Checkbox here. Okay, that's the one way you can see <coughs> the running processes. And I'm going to close it. <coughs> Everyone is okay with this one? Okay, and when you see at the desktop, you see short, shortcut to a sys internal suite. So just open this one. And there is a process explorer in around that here. Either you can use a scroll bar, or from here, you, what you can do is just click the back one, and you can type with a proc, Explore, say proc, right? Then you see you can go through directly rather than uh, using the scroll bar. This is a process explore, and you can start. <laughs> Who have used the sys internal tools? Okay, remember. And so this is another tool you can see running processes on the system. And you see the PID is listed by default here. Right. For example, explore.exe, so explorer's uh, PID is 1752. Do you see the same? Right. Yeah. Right. And this one tool, and you can close it. Okay, I close everything now. And I'll go to this internal tool again. And this time, I'll go to Prop Monitor. When you see Prop Mon, so a while ago, the Sys internal, they had like a file mon, is mem mon, probably like it's rec, uh, is a, a separate like a tools to monitor processes, uh, regis registries, reg yeah, registries. 
and that one, then they, they kind of combine to as a prop one. So when you start, say agree. So process explorer actually is showing the current state. But prop one is actually accumulating the all the events that is happening right now. They keep accumulating. So you will see these uh, events grow really fast here when you're using the prop one. Okay, and in the toolbar, when you put the uh, cursor over, it says show registry activity. So it's being currently selected. So it is showing the registry activities. When you unclick, then you're going to remove from the uh, result at the bottom. I get, the, the, get this main uh, screen here. And let's, un let's, how about, let's unclick everything. This is a file. A show file system activity. This is a show network activity. I'm gonna unclick. Then so another next one is a show process and thread activity. Let's unclick. If you unclick everything, then you see nothing here, right? So later on, when you use a prop, we will use prop one a lot, and you can select, you know, just let's say you want to see the only file system activity. When you select this one, then you will see the uh, uh, old uh, event logs. <coughs> using the uh, this prop one. Any question? Okay, now as a uh, simple example, how about anyone, can you give me PE, a PID of a camp.exe? What's a camp.exe? That's right, you can see the calculator, you see, right? Yeah, because it's not running, right? How about calculator, yes, it's a calculator, right? So you can run calculator or programs and there's accessories, calculator, right? Start, then you should have a PID, right? Anyone find it? Found the PID of calculator, you so, okay, and can you say what it is? What you 2008. 2008. 17, 16. 17, 16. Okay, how about it? Uh, 13, 16. Okay, so you see the numbers are different. So, the whole explore the ESC, we have the same PID, PID. That is because process was already running, and then I made a snapshot. Capta EFC case, you launched it, so PID actually. Uh, it's not random per se, but it's like a generated on, on the fly. So it's, you have all different PIDs because you are using the system a little bit right now, right? So some process has been launched. So anyway, okay, there was a, just a, a small example. Now, the other, uh, I'm going to slide 22. I'm going to close everything. 22 a slide. Okay, so we uh, use CFF Explorer just before, but let's open it again to look at the DLS dependencies. So I just started CFF Explorer, start CFF Explorer, and file. Open and let's open Notepad. I just from the Windows directory, C Windows and at the select file, I just typed it Notepad.exe and open. Okay, and DLA de dependencies, what I'm uh, uh, going to is, I explained that the kernel service like DLL is actually, you know, a uh, majority of function call is actually using the anti-DLL DLL, right? So that means if there's an application, but this application actually use the kernel service like DLL directly, but this kernel service to that DLL may depend on other DLLs, right? 
So it actually, uh, when the loading time, it uh, loader actually recursively load every DLL that you know application, not only the directly uh, DLL that application is directly using, but the other DLLs these on the DLS depending on, right? And in the CFF CFF Explorer, you see dependency worker, right? I select in the left panel, there's a dependency worker, right? So let's see the example. So I open the notepad.exe, there's a column 32, that DLL, and when you open it, connect it to that DLL, use anti DLL, that DLL, right? So, what this one is showing is notepad.exe actually directly use these libraries, this old tool. Nine libraries, right? But in reality, in the, in the memory, more DLL actually be, being loaded. Okay? How about from here? Okay, I want you to leave this one, CFF Explorer as it is, and all right, minimizing it. And let's go to this internal suite. And open Prop Explorer, Process Explorer. Do you see here? Okay, go to view. So this is a process explorer and go to view. And do you see low paint view? Then select DLLs. And on the upper side here, Oh, yeah. What I need to do is start the uh, notepad.exe first, actually, right? So how about this? Uh, yeah, I should follow this one. Um, yeah, let's see. How about go to start button, start, and all programs, accessories. Right, so I'm uh, starting a notepad process here. I just started but doing nothing, but notepad is open. And right, when you go back, okay, everyone has a notepad open. Good. And when you go to back to the process explorer, and you will see notepad.exe, right? And select, then at the lower uh, pane here, you see all the DLL that is being loaded. You see it is much more than the nine DLLs that the notepad actually directly depends on. Everybody's good? Okay, once you start a process, right. when you double click in window in Windows, you are double clicking is a starting or you can start launching from the DOS. Once you launch a new process, then not only the executable file, all the DLLs that this uh, executable depends on, and the DLLs, another DLL depends on everything loaded into the memory. Right? One one thing that I still want to point it out. Let's say, connecting to that DLL is a very common library every application uses. That means it is already in the uh, in the memory, right? So if new process is being loaded, that means this DLA is not actually loaded in reality. It's there, but just there's like a handle to that DLA. You, when you have the machine, there's a physical memory, four gigs, right? For example, four gigs, four gigabytes, I guess. But let's say, the, I explained that uh, this uh, process each has, you know, four, from the 32 uh, big machine case has a memory space of four gigabytes. If there's a 10 of them, how this in the physical memory holding all this, you know, if it's a 10, you know, 10 times by 4 gigabyte, how is it holding it? So it actually there's a second, uh, the, the layer is there's a physical memory, usually uh, manage there's a small blocks, 
right? And there is a lot of this, uh, when I say that a process memory space is a virtual space. It is not actually uh, mapped, uh, mapped directly to the physical. So some of them are actually uh, uh, images in the physical memory, right? So there is some mapping going on here. But in case of how it relates to the uh, uh, DLL, for example, uh, process A has using the connector to the DLL. So it's actually read into physical memory, and this process A virtual memory has you know has a linkage in it, right? If there's a new process, process B, rather than if it is using the connector to the DLL, it is rather than uh, reading this connector to the DLL into the physical memory again, rather than doing it, it just have another linkage to the existing memory, uh, physical memory. That's how it's being uh, managed. So, two processes, they, they, the cells are actually used virtual memory. Yes, process is a virtual memory. What, 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 explain, what you see here, everything is a virtual memory. Uh, you are going to see the physical memory most likely not. Because that is done by the hardware layer, or there's a hardware layer plus some OS, uh, the OS help. But in reality, yeah, you, you really don't see the physical memory. Wait, what do you see is about the virtual memory space or the virtual memory address. Okay, page uh, slide 22. Okay, and so we use this dependency worker inside the CFF uh, Explorer, but there's another separate tool that's called the Dependency Worker. Yeah, there's separate tools. So there's a lot of tools doing the you know, similar thing. You know, some tool has maybe a view and... You know. So this Dependency Worker is not the Dependency Worker? Is it, tool? I don't think so. I don't think even it, it is in, internally using it. I don't, I don't think, but I just make guess. Yeah. But there's a Dependency Worker separate tool. You can go uh, and then you can the download it. Yes. All right, thread, and everyone knows the thread, right? One process can have multiple thread, right? So, so if uh, one, uh, then each thread has to have its own stack because the when thread runs, it, it has its own context in the where you know the thread is you know it add in the code, so it has its own um, stack, and also it has you know when one thread runs, then it has its own uh, registers associated with it. And why you are using the thread is, is it much cheaper than the process, especially when there is a context, so it's you know, changing between the thread is much faster than processes. And another thing, very important thing, when you uh, talk about th uh, thread threading in the window, on the windows, inside the windows, uh, sch scheduling, scheduling is done by thread level. It is not having as a process level. So inside actually Windows OS, so you will have okay. It doesn't it doesn't say okay process one is running. Next time is process two. It doesn't do that way. Rather do okay thread one is running. Next time process is three or process four is running. So just keep, uh, keep in mind that one. So on the Windows is a thread level scheduling rather than the process. Uh, so let's say even if one process is not explicitly like a Calling like a create thread, it has at least one thread in it. That's one thing on the Windows. All right. So let's say let's say one process here we can uh, sweep at the process. So thread case it shares this by the code space. It has one code space, but it has like its own different stack here, right? So let's say if thread one is running uh, in this uh, Windows uh, Suite app, when thread one runs, then its, it's own stack is being used because a thread uh, stack is very important because it says where which function is at currently and then which you know, local variable can you know actually be used at this time at the thread one context con con uh, text and. Just show that the thread uh, users can you know, grow. Where when there's more calls, then the more uh, stacks of memory is being used. Okay, here. And when it changes context of uh, thread two, now it is using the you know, stack of that belongs to the uh, thread two. 
So it's just showing it maintain its own local variables and its own uh, context where is the program is being run is independent from the uh, thread, independent between the uh, threads. 